This is the pre-lab for the experiment synthesis of triphenylmethanol. In this video I will cover the pre-lab assignment, safety, the goals of the experiment, and the methods you'll use to achieve them, some background information, details on the experimental procedure, and information about cleaning up. Before you come to lab, you need to read all of the assigned sections in Techniques in Organic Chemistry and your Organic Chemistry textbook. Prepare your notebook using the preparative format. Diethyl ether is used in this experiment as the solvent for the reaction and as an extraction solvent. It is extremely flammable in the liquid form and even more so as a vapor. It can be harmful if inhaled and it may cause drowsiness and dizziness. It must be kept away from ignition sources such as anything that might produce a flame or a spark or even hot surfaces. You should avoid breathing the vapors. The goal of this experiment is the synthesis of triphenylmethanol, which you will make using a Grignard synthesis. To do this, you'll form a Grignard reagent by the reaction of bromobenzene with magnesium metal. That reagent is then reacted with benzophenone in the same reaction vessel to produce triphenylmethanol. The methods you'll use to um, uh, do this synthesis include the formation of the Grignard reagent under anhydrous conditions, reaction with benzophenone also under anhydrous conditions, quenching the reaction with cold aqueous acid, extraction of the product from the reaction mixture, crystallization, and melting point and TLC analysis. In 1900, Victor Grignard discovered the synthetic reaction that bears his name. It was a new method for generating carbon-carbon bonds using magnesium to couple ketones and alkyl halides. Remarkably, more than a hundred years later, it continues to be a valuable tool in organic synthesis. In the basic process, which we will discuss in detail in lecture, the reaction of an alkyl, alkenyl, or aerohalide with magnesium metal forms an organomagnesium halide compound called a Grignard reagent. This is typically done in an ether solvent under anhydrous conditions. The Grignard reagent isn't isolated but rather the solution of the reagent is then treated with an aldehyde or a ketone. After the addition, the reaction mixture is treated with aqueous acid to give an alcohol product, and the magnesium salts are subsequently discarded. The Grignard synthesis that you will carry out begins with the formation of the Grignard reagent phenyl magnesium bromide, which is made by the reaction of bromobenzene with magnesium metal. Once that is complete, it is reacted with benzophenone, a ketone. And after that, the mixture is treated with cold sulfuric acid to produce the final product. One critical requirement is that the first two steps in the sequence have to be carried out under anhydrous conditions, where special care is taken to ensure that the reagents and any of the glassware or equipment that comes into contact with them are free of any trace of water. This means that all of the glassware that you will use for the reaction must be as dry as possible. This includes not only the reaction vessel itself, but any glassware that comes into contact with the reagents and solvent used in the first two steps. Graduated cylinders, pipettes, anything you use. If you need to use a piece of glassware or equipment that is too dirty to use without washing, it's best to ask your instructor or TA for a clean replacement from the stockroom rather than try to wash and dry it for this experiment. Another precaution we will use is to employ the use of a drying tube. This is a tube that will house a solid desiccant that will be placed on top of the reflux condenser on your reaction apparatus. Reactions like the formation of a Grignard reagent are so exothermic that the solvent will boil. These kinds of reactions can never be sealed because an overpressure might shatter the vessel. So a drying tube is fitted on top of the reflux condenser allowing the pressure to be relieved while the excluding atmospheric moisture. Among the equipment in your locker is either a glass or a plastic drying tube. The tube is prepared by placing a small wad of cotton in the bottom to prevent drying agent from slipping down through the neck and then adding some drying agent. In this experiment we will use anhydrous calcium chloride and another wad of cotton on top to prevent the drying agent from spilling out. 
tube is then inserted through a rubber thermometer adapter, which is attached to an inlet adapter. This then can be fitted to the top of your reflux condenser. Mm. The key to a successful Grignard synthesis is the careful execution of the formation of the Grignard reagent. Your first order of business when you arrive to lab will be to assemble the reaction apparatus pictured here. It consists of a 500 milliliter three neck round bottom flask, a reflux condenser, a drying tube and adapter, an addition funnel, and two glass stoppers. As with any reaction apparatus, start the assembly by clamping the round bottom flask to your rack and then fit the remaining pieces to it. The formation of the Grignard reagent is sufficiently exothermic that the ether will boil, so the reflux condenser needs to be hooked up to cooling water in the usual fashion. As I described earlier, the drying tube needs to be freshly prepared. A magnetic stir bar is then added to the flask, and it's positioned over a stirrer. Now the reagents are introduced. Because the Grignard formation is so highly exothermic, mixing all of the bromobenzene with all of the magnesium could result in a runaway reaction. We can prevent this by introducing only a portion of the bromobenzene to start with, and then adding the remainder slowly later on. So you'll begin by adding 10 milliliters of anhydrous ether and about a milliliter of the bromobenzene to the flask. The remaining bromobenzene you'll dissolve in 10 more milliliters of anhydrous ether, ether and place in the addition funnel. The final step in starting the reaction is to add the magnesium. We'll be using magnesium turnings, small flakes of magnesium about 2 millimeters in size. One of the problems with this form of magnesium is that the surface is coated with magnesium oxide because magnesium naturally relaxes reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere. In order for the reaction to occur, bromobenzene has to come in contact with fresh unoxidized magnesium metal. So to ensure that fresh magnesium metal is exposed, you'll lightly crush it in a mortar and pestle, breaking a few of the turnings, and quickly add it to the reaction. Before you crush the magnesium, fit a powder funnel into one neck of the round bottom flask, dump all the magnesium in a small mortar, give it three or four quick grinds with the pestle, and quickly transfer it into the reaction vessel and stopper the flask. At this point, you can turn on the magnetic stirrer and wait. The stirrer should be set on a slow speed, otherwise it will scatter the magnesium turnings up onto the sides of the flask where they won't come in contact with the bromobenzene. Typically, Grignard reactions start very slowly with little or no sign of reaction for five or even ten minutes. The first sign that the reaction has started is that the solution will turn cloudy like you see here. Feel free to stop the stirrer occasionally to get a better view. It also helps to move the stirrer out of the way so that you can view the mixture with the black bench in the background. The other sign is that the reaction will start to warm up. You can place your bare hand on the bottom of the flask to judge whether it feels warm or not. If either or both of these things happen, the reaction is on its way. A few minutes later, the temperature will rise to the point that the ether begins to boil and the solution will turn brown and clear. You can then begin dripping in the remaining bromobenzene solution from the addition funnel. This should be done slowly over the course of about 10 minutes or so at a rate that maintains a steady reflux. After the addition is complete, five more milliliters of anhydrous ether is added in one portion and the reaction is stirred for 30 minutes. By that time, the solution should have cooled off and it should appear brown and clear. There should be very little, if any, magnesium left. The next stage of the reaction is the addition of the ketone. A solution of benzophenone in anhydrous ether is placed in the addition funnel and added slowly dropwise. Almost immediately, the reaction should turn bright pink. This is evidence of the formation of the triphenyl methoxy anion. This step is also exothermic, and if you feel the flask, there should be evidence that it has warmed up. You can add the benzophenone solution at a rate that maintains a steady reflux. Partway through the addition, you should see a white precipitate begin to form. If you look closely at this picture, there are faint swirls of white in the pink solution. 
At this point, the ether is saturated with the triphenylmethoxy anion, and it's beginning to precipitate out as the white magnesium bromide salt. As you continue, more and more of the salt precipitates until it appears to be one solid mass. It's not, it's just a lot of solid in a relatively small amount of ether. The final stage of the synthesis is the addition of 10% sulfuric acid. This provides the proton to convert triphenylmethoxy anion into the final product. Like the previous steps, this is also very exothermic. So we chill the sulfuric acid by mixing it with ice just before we add it, and begin the addition very slowly and dropwise. Unlike the triphenylmethoxy anion salt, the triphenylmethanol product is very soluble in ether. So just as soon as the acid comes into contact with the solid in the flask, you should see the solid begin to dissolve. The triphenylmethanol is dissolving in the ether, and the magnesium salts are dissolving in the water. During the addition, the temperature will rise to the point where the ether begins to boil once again. Keep adding the acid to maintain a steady reflux. By the end, you should have a mixture consisting of an ether layer on top with an aqueous layer on the bottom. It's important this, at this point to turn the stirrer up so that the layers are vigorously mixed and all the solids are dissolved. It's essential that you get all the solids dissolved before you continue on to the extraction part of the process. Here are some useful tips. When you arrive to lab, go straight to your locker and begin assembling the reaction apparatus. Because Grignard reactions can be finicky and sometimes difficult to get started, it's important to begin as soon as possible in case you run into problems later on. One thing that can save some time is to recognize that some things, like solvent volumes, don't have to be measured very carefully. If you were to use 9.5 milliliters of ether instead of 10, it won't have any effect on the reaction. On the other hand, reagents like bromobenzene and magnesium need to be measured very carefully and accurately. During the course of this experiment, two different grades of ether will be used. The anhydrous ether used for the formation of the Grignard reagent and the addition of benzophenone has been specially dried in a purification system that reduces dissolved water to just a few parts per million. Later in the experiment, you'll use so-called solvent ether for extraction. Since it will be mixed with an aqueous solution, there's no need for it to be purified in the same manner as the anhydrous ether. Make sure you use the proper ether at each step of the process. They will be labeled clearly. Let's take a look closer look at the formation of the Grignard reagent and the source of a couple possible side products. The mechanism for the formation of the Grignard reagent begins with a one electron reduction of bromobenzene that produces a phenyl radical, bromide ion and a plus one magnesium ion. The magnesium ion then reduces the phenyl radical to phenyl anion to produce the Grignard reagent. Both of these phenyl species, the radical and the anion, are the source of potential side products. One well-known reaction is the coupling of phenyl radicals to produce biphenyl. While much slower than the formation of the Grignard itself, it proceeds at a rate that inevitably produces biphenyl in the reaction mixture. The other side product results if any water contaminates the reaction. Grignard reagents are powerful bases and easily deprotonate water. In this reaction, the result would be the production of benzene. If some benzene were produced in the reaction, nothing special has to be done in the purification process because it's so volatile it will simply evaporate during the isolation of the solid triphenylmethanol. Biphenyl is a crystalline solid and could potentially contaminate the triphenylmethanol. To deal with this, we take advantage of its solubility in hexane. In the last stage of isolating triphenylmethanol, we add hexane to a solution of the product mixture in ether. The mixture is placed on a steam bath and boiled to reduce its volume until crystals appear. We take it off the steam bath at that point and allow it to cool. After cooling it further in an ice bath, we filter off the crystals. Essentially what we're doing is replacing the polar ether with the non-polar hexane. Ether has a much lower boiling point than hexane and comes off on the steam bath. Triphenylmethanol has a relatively high solubility in ether and low solubility in hexane, so as the ether boils off, the hexane remains and the triphenylmethanol begins to crystallize. 
Biphenyl, on the other hand, is very soluble in hex hexane and remains in solution. This is relatively easy to confirm, as you will find when you do a TLC analysis of your crystals alongside the filtrate from the crystallization and a biphenyl standard at the end of the experiment. Finally, cleaning up. Place all of the solids and the organic liquids in the appropriately labeled waste containers. Any aqueous solutions can be rinsed down the drain.